subject of my talk this evening is St. Kieran Miquelon, of course, my favorite uh, subject, and the stamp shortage of 1926. Uh, this wasn't the only stamp shortage that they had over the years. Um, there's one in uh, uh, 1885 to 1886, uh, but they managed to uh, get the supplies of stamps to St. Pierre uh, until sometime in 1926 when the stamp shortage uh, showed up. So I'm gonna talk about a little bit about the, uh, uh, just where we are in the North Atlantic here with uh, St. Pierre and Miquelon, a little bit of geography and climate. Uh, political circumstances uh, surrounding the colony uh, and also um, in 1905, the colony became a lot smaller when the French shore was uh, given back to Newfoundland, if you want. Uh, also uh, in the 1920s, uh, there's various industrial circumstances uh, I'll talk about. The fishery, of course, codfish was the big thing back in those days. And what they called la fraude, which was shipping the liquor uh, down to the United States during prohibition, which was, uh, took them away from the fishery, but it made them more money. Uh, so the stamp shortage uh, occurred in 1926. And uh, the way that they uh, solved the stamp shortage was issuing the so-called PP provisional hand stamps. Now, in earlier days, of course, they would have taken whatever stock they had uh, in the post office and overprinted it with, uh, and, and speculated in it, and all the merchants would have made a few dollars off of it. But I think by this time, they were sort of under the gun from the uh, Ministry of Colonies not to do those types of things. So they sort of uh, did the, the best thing they could think of. And I'll, I'll sort of put out a chronology of how they appeared and uh, eventually a little catalog list of ones to look for. So here we are in uh, uh, the Maritime Provinces in Newfoundland, Canada. St. Pierre is the tiny little 90 square mile uh, islands that sit in this particular position. I'm going to get a little bit personal as I go along here because uh, Sydney, Nova Scotia sits right in here. And of course, there's North Sydney where the boats landed. I was born in Sydney way back when. And uh, so this was the jumping off point uh, for to get to Newfoundland uh, and to St. Pierre in particular. And a lot of the uh, goods and stuff and the trade that went on with Canada would be done uh, uh, initially through uh, their, their boats back and forth between North Sydney and North Sydney. Uh, the problem with North Sydney is that it, the harbor froze up in the winter time, so uh, they would divert their uh, boats and, and go up through to Halifax, which was ice free in the winter time. So that's uh, uh, how you end up getting a, a mail uh, directed. Uh, Packbow mail to Halifax and, of course, uh, seasonally to, uh, to Sydney or North Sydney. So they're sort of isolated in the North Atlantic. Um, and formerly, of course, it was uh, uh, the last remaining uh, speck of French territory after they'd lost Ile Royale, which is Cape Breton Island, uh, Nova Scotia, which was Acadia and included uh, New Brunswick over here and all of Quebec, probably all of Ontario and you almost go out to Manitoba. And then there was uh, Louisiana. Uh, I guess they sold that one before the, the bitter end, but they kept losing the wars and sort of as a lifeline uh, to, to kind of prevent uh, rioting in France the British allowed them, or the treaties allowed them to keep the small islands of St. Pierre and Miquelon so they could supply the home country with all kinds of codfish and keep everybody uh, uh, from revolting over in France because they couldn't find enough to eat. So the two main islands, and I, they're shown down here uh, in an enlargement, St. Pierre is the main town, it's on the island of the same name, uh, these two islands were once separated across here, but that's known as the dune. 
And that's where all the shipwrecks uh, in the 17th, 18th century uh, would find their doom uh, landing between uh, what they call Langlade, this island here, and Miquelon up in here. Uh, Miquelon is also the name of the small little uh, village that sits in here. And over time, there's only been about three post offices in the whole place. So little post office, the main one at St. Pierre, uh, one up in Langlade where there were summer cottages. And of course, uh, the smaller settlement up at Miquelon. So the climate is harsh, snowy winters. Uh, and the other thing here, just getting around, ice jams can block sea access. Uh, summers are mild, but boy, you can get fogged in pretty quickly on, on St. Pierre. Just to continue the story, I was born here in, in Sydney and uh, just after the war, and my, both my mother and father were in the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force. And my dad, he went looking for a job in, uh, in Nova Scotia where my mother came from uh, and couldn't find anything, but the peacetime Air Force was looking for recruits. So he signed on since he knew all about that from the, the war days. And we got, his first posting was in Halifax. Then we were over in Quebec and then on into Ontario. Uh, and then we came back to the Maritimes in the 50s uh, at the Greenwood Air Base over here. And then my dad, who was in air traffic control at the time, he, felt, he got uh, told he was now uh, going to be posted over to St. John's, Newfoundland. There's St. John's, Newfoundland. So I ended up going to high school in St. John's. So that's how I knew a, a quite a bit about the geography and uh, sort of kindled my interest in St. Pierre uh, uh, as we went along. The other thing to notice about the climate, I can remember in 1962, the ice jam came. What happens is the ice on a very cold winter forms up in, in uh, uh, around PEI and it starts coming out as not quite icebergs, but smaller hunks of ice. And it jams up the whole of the coast in here to the, to the uh, extent that the grocery stores in Newfoundland start to run out of uh, groceries, uh, which is a tense time for a while until uh, uh, eventually spring comes and, and it moves it out. So I, the reason I mention that is uh, that may be one of the reasons why we ended up with a stamp shortage here was uh, the ships just couldn't get in. But, you know, you go and research this stuff and the uh, North Atlantic Ice Patrol, which is put on, I think, by the uh, U.S. Coast Guard. I keep looking for their old reports, and uh, it, it happens that uh, 1926 wasn't a particularly bad year for ice, so that's uh, one theory that uh, kind of goes by the wayside. So the history of St. Pierre <coughs> is that it got traded back and forth between the French and the English. Uh, you, there are even some uh, Americans that uh, I think uh, took it over uh, uh, during one of these skirmishes uh, from New England. And when we got to about uh, between 1783 and 1904, there's sort of two parts to uh, French Newfoundland. There was St. Pierre Miquelon, which in 1816, the uh, uh, treaty uh, gave them back to France. So they, the French settlers moved back in and got their fishing going again. But there was a, an area from Cape Ray all the way around to Cape St. John where they had fishing rights. So the French fleets would come to St. Pierre for the Grand Banks and they'd also come from the offshore fishing to all the little settlements that they put in here. Now, they didn't have rights beyond the shore, but they had the fishing rights. And in 1904, there was a big swap. The Entente Cordiale between the French and the English went and swapped a bunch of uh, jungle uh, in Africa and gave back to the British or the Newfoundlanders here, uh, the, uh, what they call the French shore, which is the blue line uh, along here. So this was a big disappointment to the St. Pierre guys because here was a, you know, a big chunk of, uh, of 
business that they could get that uh, went back to the, uh, the Newfoundlanders. And there was always uh, uh, bad blood between the Newfoundlanders and the, and the St. Pierre because they're always trying to fish uh, you know, the same grounds and uh, the Newfoundlanders would put a tax on the bait and uh, they'd uh, retaliate uh, uh, by there. And, and the, the different treaties used to be in, enforced by the British Navy and the French Navy uh, and, and sometimes it would go against uh, the French or against the English uh, as things would be. So there's a lot of quarreling that kind of uh, happened in there. So there's uh, again the uh, islands that I talked about. The various earlier names were Grand Miquelon and Petit Miquelon and of course St. Pierre down here. Green Island uh, was on the, uh, the French side. The border between Newfoundland or which is now Canada, would come right about through here. And this jumping off point to get the ferry, which because of COVID is not operating anymore, is Fortune. And they got themselves a brand new Spank and fan, uh, new uh, uh, ferry that was gonna carry cars and, and come across uh, and land at St. Pierre and bring all the tourists in. The only problem is, this is gonna cost a million dollars to be able to drive the cars off the ferry with the new installation in St. Pierre. So this is kind of up in the air and the uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, business uh, is not helping uh, tourism obviously in St. Pierre and uh, uh, in Newfoundland, I think has a 14 day quarantine period if you wanna go there. Uh, and well, as, as you realize in, in both the United States and Canada that we're still fighting the virus and I'm uh, afraid the virus might be winning, but let's hope uh, for better things. <clears throat> now, Pierre, St. Pierre during 1926 was during the prosperous times of La Fraude. Now, this is a picture of the uh, main uh, uh, key on St. Pierre and all the boxes that you see in here are full of liquor that have come through from the uh, distilleries in Montreal and they store them in these warehouses back in here. And these little boats take them along the eastern seaboard and offload them to get uh, sales out of the uh, prohibition uh, prone United States at the time. So this was lots of uh, business was generated. Everybody was making a lot of money. Uh, and of course, from communications point of view, uh, the uh, mail was was the way to go. So it was quite important there. Although if you really wanted to get a message out, uh, there, there were telegraph offices and cables that uh, attached to Europe and, and uh, in America from that came through St. Pierre. Ah, the La Fraude made a millionaire of Henry Marois and uh, he became a philatelic celebrity uh, more recently where he appeared uh, after his death on a St. Pierre stamp. So we can see some of the uh, history in here and here he is uh, uh, in, in his uh, uh, element here with the bottles of liquor uh, ready to get shipped out to the United States. And you can see the again, a little close up here, the crates of uh, uh, liquor bottles. Uh, so the, the liquor was legal here. It was imported from Canada, Europe, and the West Indies. And I mean, it used to come in bottles and it used to come in these big tin cans. Uh, and at its height, 30,000 cases a month were diverted from St. Pierre to the United States. Again, wooden crazes and, and uh, drums of, uh, of liquor. Uh, uh, and you can see the uh, warehouses where they would, would uh, uh, store all this stuff uh, waiting for shipment south. So by 1926, uh, St. Pierre and Michelin had become the hub of liquor smuggling for the eastern part of uh, North America. And Canada became one of the biggest producers of spirits in the world. This is the famous Seagram's family, Hiram Walker, uh, BC distilleries. Uh, they had prohibition in Canada, but they could ship the stuff off to St. Pierre and, and uh, 
Uh, they saw their profits skyrocket uh, from thirsty Americans. Uh, and the so-called rum runners, uh, it's a term that applied to the mariners that ran the rum and also to their uh, uh, rum running ships. Okay, these are sort of the lower value uh, stamps that were current in St. Pierre. You can see we go from one centime and we come out uh, on the high end uh, to uh, one franc. And there were higher values in this, but these were the ones that were commonly used. So uh, for example, postcards, if it, if it had uh, uh, um, uh, no at no message on the back would get a five cent team stamp. Uh, a postcard with some writing on the back would get a ten cent team. Uh, the uh, um, most used uh, uh, value was the thirty cent team that got your letter to France, and uh, various other uh, uh, rates that uh, would apply in here. So these were printed in Paris and delivered to St. Pierre. And St. Pierre, for the most part, had a, 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 a habit, the post office did, of keeping a lot of old stamps on, on board here uh, in, back in their storerooms. Uh, one of the outcomes of these was when uh, war finally hit and the French, uh, uh, free French invaded, they had lots of stamps at, at that point to overprint. But for some reason here, with certain values, uh, they did end up running out. And there's a particular pattern that occurs to a stamp shortage. <clears throat> At first, this post office has exhausted its supply of, say, the letter rate or the common rate stamps. So it begins to offer lower denominations to make up the letter rate. So you have funny combinations on covers. So you get uh, unusual combinations and even large blocks of low value stamps to make up the proper rate. Well, eventually the supplies of the lower values are depleted and some sort of cash payment system has to be devised to prepay the correct postage. They were more or less politically uh, denied uh, taking the higher values and overprinting the heck out of them as they had done in earlier years. So they had to come up with a bit of solution. Well, one of the sort of rules they went by was, gee was you know, we can't look bad <laughs> in other countries, you know. We must uh, keep our, uh, our head up and uh, our reputation intact. So one of the rules was that uh, when they did get to a, a system, and this would be a, an over or a, 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 a cache system, that uh, these were only value, uh, valued uh, going to France and to other uh, French colonies. If you're sending money to, or, or a letter to the United States or to Canada or some other uh, foreign country, uh, those were to use be, be, uh, to use stamps that were uh, you know kept under the counter at the post office. So there again are the two stamps that are uh, 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 starting to run out uh, first, and then we get to the other one, lower denominations as we go. So in March of 1926, they uh, began running uh, low on the two denominations let's talk about. And these, of course, are from the long running pictorial set uh, issued in 1909 with color changes. Uh, and you get the uh, famous if you're, it's famous for uh, collectors of St. Pierre of the uh, 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 seabird and of course the St. Pierre fisherman with his uh, beard and sou'wester hat. So this is the type of thing that really got my eye when uh, you, you come across this and you try and discover why this uh, envelope which is addressed to uh, a lumber company in Gas Bay is franked with so many stamps with combinations and overlapping. So the cover is addressed to a commercial firm, like I say, in Quebec. It's postmarked March the 23rd, 1926. And it's frank with 25 two cent stamps prepaying the proper 50 cent, 
50 centime uh, commercial invoice rate to Canada. Of course, trying to fit all these stamps on the limited uh, envelope space was a, a bit of a, a bit of a problem. But we can see what's happened here. Uh, you got to send this letter to uh, the lumber supplier in, uh, in, in Gaspé, Quebec. Uh, you take it to the post office. They have run out of uh, the 50 centime stamp that probably would have uh, taken the letter there. And you're left, because it's going to a foreign country, we want to make sure our stamps get recognized. So uh, you go and fill it up with these two cent stamps. I have another example something similar, uh, again, going to Montreal and gets frank with odd values. And of course, you look for the, the dates in uh, March of 1926, when you know uh, something's going on here, they're, they're running out of stamps. Uh, anyways, post that's posted on the 27th. Uh, so they're running out of certain values of the stamps in here. Uh, now, Story covers that start to show uh, uh, the use of odd values and, and lots of stamps on the envelope. Uh, they're pretty rare. These are the only two that I've seen. And I missed one, I think, on uh, uh, a computer auction. Uh, and you look for the dates and you look for, uh, of course, a, a mixture of odd looking stamps that uh, uh, somebody takes a lot of time to, uh, to put on the envelope to get it there. So I'm still looking for some more. And if you know of any, uh, I'd like to hear about them. <laughs> so the solution to the problem here was a provisional hand stamp that's used to pay the postage charges to France and local and inner island addresses and also uh, to other French colonies. I have seen two of these from uh, uh, French colonies, uh, I think in Africa that for some reason, uh, uh, they, they uh, uh, got them posted to them from uh, St. Pierre. And I'll talk about uh, the, the philatelic, uh, the local philatelic interest in these as we go along too. So the letters were handed along with the cash payment across the post office count and the postal clerk applied the hand stamp and postmarked the envelope much as you see here. So this is a cover to France the rate is 30 centime in the hand stamp, again dated early in March. So I think this is a very early one dated at March the 29th, 1926. A couple of things to notice about these. Number one, they use the French word government in here. And uh, a lot of times uh, the, the unknowledgeable uh, think that these are official stamps. Well, uh, and that they're only for say government use, but no, these are what went across the counter. The envelope was supplied by the uh, postal patron in here and he pays his money and he gets the hand stamp and they cancel it properly and put it in the mailbag uh, to find its way to Paris. Of course, most of the mail that came out of St. Pierre went via Canada. So it went on the a government postal boat uh, to I guess a Sydney in the winter time or in the summertime rather and Halifax uh, ice free uh, in the winter time. So uh, this is certainly the, the days before uh, the aircraft or other means of uh, moving mail. So looking at this in more detail, like I say, the, uh, the word government uh, uh, doesn't really imply a special type of issue, but sometimes they're incorrectly described in auction catalogs and dealers lists. So the early type PP uh, in French uh, post pay, uh, the French word for government in here, Saint Pierre, and you can start to make out uh, little kinds of mislettering. Yeah. So I've got Saint here and I'm missing a letter here. And I think when you look at enough of these, you realize some of these missing letters are actually missing rather than mis, mis inked. The other thing to look at is the little part underneath here where it gives the town name. Now, 
there's only one town that used these. Now they did move them up to some of the smaller little villages where you can, uh, uh, where a few of them were used. But you can see here, uh, Saint Pierre, and it's spelled out. So we've got Saint Pierre, and as we go along, uh, we'll see that this changes and this changes as we go along uh, 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 through time. So there ended up being six types and I've listed them in uh, my catalog that I put out many years ago. Uh, and I've recorded them by denominations. Uh, type one is non-denominated. So this is not type one, this is a later type. And then I've taken them by the five sound team and the 30 sound team uh, as these, they issue different, different rate numbers. Uh, some of these are difficult to know why they did the various uh, uh, types, uh, but we'll run through them as, as we go. Uh, the dates of use have been established by Stone I used to correspond with uh, Robert Stone many years ago on these. Uh, his uh, advice to me was, uh, "Don't don't pay too much money for them, okay?" But I'll show you where the uh, the very ones are, the ones that were only used for one day and or two days, as we go along here. <clears throat> so this is what the the typical cover looks like. And what you find is that uh, the local residents were very philatelic savvy. They figured, well, this was something uh, they hadn't seen before. All their friends and, and dealers in France could use a, a, a couple of them here. Uh, you can see that uh, the Newfoundland uh, store company, the owner of that uh, was a well-known stamp dealer. And of course, uh, he had a few of these lying around, so he puts a one cent uh, uh, stamp from the, the current set on there, uh, uh, which is rather meaningless as far as uh, rate goes. He gets uh, uh, his uh, PP30 uh, in here again with the St. Pierre on here. And here we are, April 26, as we go, and he's sent it to somebody he knows in France. And this happens to be number 12 of, I don't know how many, maybe he had a uh, hundred of them, I don't know. But these were great novelties uh, for the uh, philatelic wary uh, uh, in, in St. Pierre. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what this does is it sort of shows us that uh, there's a few stamps that are maybe still available. Maybe they're in merchant stores or something like this and they find themselves onto covers. Even the ones that are, you know, you, you can't even get at the post office anymore. So one of the uh, things you wanna do with these, uh, particularly if uh, you're philatelically minded is make sure that uh, you've got them registered. So this is a typical cover a gamer in April 26, 1926. So we're early on in the stamp shortage. And it's a uh, registered to Paris from Saint Pierre. And it's franked with uh, the cachet that we see here the, uh, for the PP30. This is again the, the first type. We haven't got into a second and third and fourth type yet. And uh, some of these smaller values in here, which uh, uh, somebody had probably uh, uh, had in his stock uh, after the post office had ran out is used to uprate the uh, uh, to the registration rate which was an extra 75 centimes. So we have a quite a combination of uh, uh, rates in here uh, to to uh, prepay the registration rate while the uh, uh, regular letter rate is paid with the hand stamp. <laughs> so, but this is uh, sort of April and supplies are diminishing. Probably anybody has held a, a stock in their store or at the post office. So we're, we're running out of stamps here eventually as we go along. 
And you probably won't see, what you'll see is a single five or 75 centime stamp instead of sort of a bunch of things making up the 75 cent rate. Well, here we, we uh, uh, with the registration rate at 75 cents, you even get uh, some overvalued stamps. Here's the one franc uh, paying the registration rate while the regular postage rate is again paid by our initial uh, hand stamp in here. Uh, why would this happen? Maybe, maybe somebody had a shortage of the 75 cent stamps and overpaid it just to get the letter out. Again, uh, we start to see uh, uh, higher denominations still uh, used to make up the uh, 75 centime rate. Again, the initial hand stamp is still in here. And we're in April going into May. And uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting here is I pointed this one out as one of the stamps, you know, that was in shortage, but somebody had one and was using it. but we got a bit ways to go on the stamp shortage here before uh, maybe uh, other denominations like that uh, are, are you won't see as we go along. <laughs> so there seemed to be a, a, a bit of a problem in some of the uh, explanations of why these come about or why there's even a stamp shortage have not been discovered even at this uh, late date here. So they introduce a another hand stamp and instead of having a 30 pp 30 in there they have a pp and again a five centime now this the five centime rate got your letter from saint pierre up to michelon and they seem to also because they discontinued the uh, uh the pp 30 it also seems to get your letter, maybe with the payment of some additional cash to, to uh, France, like uh, we see here. So again, we have the government in here, the PP005, the St. Pierre, Michelon, and in the box down below here, again, spelled out the St. Pierre. Now, the problem here is this is the scarce one. It was, it was used for two days, May the 6th to 7th. And it was introduced on May the 6th. And, that, and it indicates, like I say, the, the five centime local rate, but covers using the PP005 hand stamps posted to France, must of course have paid the difference between the letter rate and cash at the post office counter. So it was rather confusing system. And it may be the reason for the short period that the PP005 hand stamps were in use. Now, I'm gonna show you the other 005, the PP005 that was only in use for one day, but you'll notice there's a change in the hand stamp. I'll get to that in the next slide or two. So there's all kinds of things going on here. Uh, you see mail from uh, various notables, since I think it's uh, Jean-Jacques uh, Tillard's uh, grandfather and stuff like this. I've seen one uh, used on a cover with no postmark at all, tying it to the to the letter. I guess uh, you got those across the counter as a uh, as a favor on the whole thing. So thing to note about this one is the 005 used for two days only. Uh, You've got the full St. Pierre spelled out here. We'll go on. So here's the five centime denomination caches. And there's one that we've discovered that uh, looks a bit different from the, the uh, actual ones, and that is a forgery. So there's, if you want, three types if you include the forgery here. This is the one we just talked about, St. Pierre spelled out. This is the forgery used on May the 6th, of course. And you can see that these little letters and, and numbers in here 
are very thin and they're a little bit taller than the actual ones over here, okay? Now, for a long time, I considered this to be a, a, an odd one, a forgery. And I understand from Jean-Jacques Tillard in St. Pierre that he has written a, uh, a, an article in a French uh, a publication with a, a co-author there where they've proven that uh, the cover with the PP005 on them, and they always come in a complete cover, is a forgery and that even the cancellations and the receiving cancellation in France is a forgery. So we got this one, which is pretty scarce. This one is a ringer. And then we go to the one day use in the 6th of May. And you'll notice that the big difference here, it's a PP005, but they've abbreviated the St. Pierre down little box that you see here. So the lower rectangle reads the abbreviation St. Pierre. So we've headed into the rarities, okay? Uh, the rarity here for, for the sixth and seventh uh, with the full St. Pierre, it's the one to look for. Uh, what's it worth? Well, it's very scarce from my point of view here. I spent several years hoping to get a PP005. And of course, one day I had to arrive from an auction lot, <laughs> uh, which I was very happy about. I also bought, I think, a few from St. Pierre from some collectors out there that were on these very nice, what they call ladies covers, uh, which fit very nice into a uh, collection page. And of course, the scarcest one has to be the one day usage in here with the abbreviated St. Pierre down at the bottom here. So now you know all my secrets about where to find the scarce ones here. So this is, uh, like I say, the forgery. Uh, it gets easy to pick out once you uh, have seen one or two of them here. Uh, again, I've enlarged the, uh, uh, the uh, hand stamp here, you can see that the uh, things are just too thin through here. They did a pretty good job in that. Let me pull things back up. Ah, that's not it. Okay, and also I'm told that the receiving mark, now usually Unregistered mail doesn't get a receiving mark. So maybe that's a, also a dead giveaway to the forgery. Apparently this is a forged cancellation uh, that uh, shows up for uh, Dijon uh, uh, where the, in France, where uh, the forger has uh, forged the receiving mark to kind of uh, uh, give us some, some legitimacy. And again, uh, the only date that's known for the forgery is on May the 6th. So somebody's figured this out and figures, well, let's produce the, the rarest one that we can find and uh, he doesn't quite get it right. Okay, these are these lady covers I was talking about. And again, uh, only used on two days uh, and you have the May the 6th and the May the 7th. Now there's been a, a bit of research, I think by Jean Jacques on there trying to figure out the dates that these occurred. And uh, I think one theory is that uh, they don't occur on certain dates because the post office was closed. So I've got to look at myself uh, and find a, a uh, 1926 calendar and start to uh, maybe uh, check the dates. Uh, at one point several years ago in a, I know a, an, an English auction, they had a, a bunch of these and they had about 75, probably mostly the common type in here. And uh, it would be nice to maybe have a, a large number of them and see if you couldn't date the stamp shortage period day by day and see if there are any gaps when the post office was, was not open. I believe for the most part it was closed Sunday, uh, but there's maybe some more research can be done. But also I get to the point where uh, so I have a calendar <laughs> collection of these covers uh, uh, 
I've, I've since moved on to maybe looking at uh, uh, other other varieties uh, in Saint Pierre. Anyway, these are the ladies' covers, uh, uh, and and they were used uh, throughout uh, decades and decades in Saint Pierre. And essentially, what they uh, held were little messages on calling cards that would fit inside the envelopes. And sometimes you'll get these that have, have a printed uh, calling card of one of the locals and maybe a note down to the bottom, uh, like congratulations on your wedding or a, a nice addition to the family or whatever uh, that they could uh, uh, send through here. I guess this was before the days of the, the telephone call or the, the email message and uh, for uh, five centime, uh, you can catch somebody down the road uh, with a message. And some of these larger covers uh, are also common. Uh, uh, and this is, of course, the one day usage. This is the ST Pierre in here. And you start to recognize local merchants. There's Louis Tilliard, uh, I believe, an early relative of Jean Jacques. Uh, Mr. Ernest Hardy, he held the uh, ESO, uh, or as they call it in Canada, the Imperial Oil uh, uh, Station in Saint Pierre uh, for supplying all the uh, fuel oil and, and the gasoline. And you can see these are again. You look for the date, it's May the sixth, twenty six. Uh, this one looks like it gets a little bit over inked. Uh, again, that this would be the the very scarcest one day usage in here. What's it worth? It's hard to know because you sell, seldom find them. And like I say, the ones I do have uh, shown here in my collection, uh, it was maybe 20, 25 years before you came across the uh, PP005s as you kept uh, sort of searching for them, knowing that they existed and that they're the scarcest. Okay, so they were having trouble with the PP005. And you use that with a bit of cash to pay your letter to Paris or other parts of France. Or you could use it as a uh, five centime to get your letter from St. Pierre up to uh, Miquelon uh, locally. Uh, I guess this wasn't working out too well for them. So they finally went to a hand stamp undenominated. I don't know, this is some clues here for other postal administrations to see what happens when uh, you run out of stamps uh, and the different solutions, uh, the ones that, the, the solutions that worked and the solutions that didn't work. Well, apparently if you just put the PB in there, you can put your letter, put a PP on it and charge you know, the appropriate rate without having it uh, show up on the letter. So apparently the confusion uh, gave rise probably to the PP undenominated hand stamp. Look below here, it is spelled out, the Saint Pierre. Uh, again, maybe some missing letters that don't show up. Looks like it shows up uh, on, on uh, this cover here. And this is a cover that's uh, gone across the harbor to uh, uh, and, and up the shore to uh, Miquelon. So it's addressed to Miquelon. So he's probably paying the uh, five centime rate even though it's, it, it's undenominated. And there's a receiving mark that you begin to see on, on, on this one just to, to help it out here. Miquelon, Saint Pierre Miquelon. Uh, and again, we're into May of, of 26 as we go here. So <clears throat> at certain points here, uh, I've gone and recorded the different dates that I have, either from my own collection or other collections in here. And this needs a little bit more research just to compare it to a calendar from 1926. Uh, so there's always uh, a bit more information that can be, can be gotten. Here's a couple more of, of the PP undenominated types. Uh, these are the ones that uh, 
probably cost you the five centime because it's a, a small lady's letter uh, in, in mail from St. Pierre to St. Pierre. And again, when you see the EV here, that stands for en ville, which is France for in town. So this is again, a, a local, or as we call it in, in other circles, drop letters that uh, probably don't even leave the post office. Okay, so the PP idea here was maybe having confusion when you sent your letter to France and all it said was PP with no denomination. So they've introduced uh, a 030 30 centime. They put the P, P in there and they put periods and French quotation marks across here. The other thing that you'll notice is that it says St. Pierre in the abbreviation, ST Pierre. So they got somebody designing each of these things and they make subtle changes as they go along. Uh, you know, is this to prevent forgery or, or just uh, uh, that uh, use up type that they've, they've got and these rubber stamps as we go along here. So this is the uh, other type. Again, we're into June and July. Don't worry, the mail boat with the rest of the supply of stamps is on its way uh, and it's gonna arrive here uh, in a couple of slides. So here we go. This is a, uh, a regular letter here to uh, France. Again, you can see the postmark there. This would be July. Uh, and then you wanna do a registered Forget using the smaller denomination stamps, they're probably all used up. So we're using a 75 here to pay the registration rate again to France. And I've again recorded uh, some of the dates of usage that I have. Uh, probably not complete, but uh, at one point I was, uh, um, uh, you know, compiling these. So we continue on. Again, the uh, hand stamps here to France. Again, with the St. Pierre and the, and the PP in quotation marks here, July, we're getting into the uh, 6th of July in here. Time is moving on. Now, we're looking at here is uh, the postmark styles of the main post offices and the uh, uh, subsidiary post offices using the model that's used in France. So here is a, a, a PP uh, used uh, to Miquelon. So what happens here is the main post office uses the circular postmark. And like in France, you use this um, one, two, three, four, five, six sided Miquelon uh, postmark here as a receiving mark. Okay, we move over and this is a uh, letter to Langlade. If you remember Langlade, it was the South Island of the two that were attached where uh, much of the notables uh, from St. Pierre had their summer cottages and where they went to do their uh, deer and rabbit hunting uh, in the spring and summer. Uh, and so you've got uh, Langlade, again, the subsidiary post office, with the six-sided postmark in here. And the third postmark type, again, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, lower, if you want, class of post office, Il Ocean's Saint Pierre. It, it reads Isle of Dogs, but the dogs in the uh, name were dogfish, okay, rather than, uh, puppy dogs if you want. Uh, what happened uh, in the 1930s was the local uh, priest decided that uh, Il Ocean was not a good name for a place, the island of dogs. So he uh, persuaded everybody to change it to Il O Marin. So Mariner's Island is where the postmark uh, went to, but it was still Il Ocean's back in 1926. Uh, when these letters were exchanged here. So we start to see Miquelon, the village on the island of the same name, 
Langlade on the southern end of that particular double island, if you want. Uh, in the harbor in, in uh, St. Pierre is where <coughs> the Ile Ocean sits. It's a very nice place to visit because in the 50s, the fishermen more or less moved to town and uh, they have a, a, an old fort out there. Uh, uh, an old fort is just a bunch of uh, hills with some cannon on them. They have uh, the uh, Apigelitude, uh, the uh, uh, museum and a bunch of old houses and things to look at over there. So uh, it's a tourist spot in the summertime. You can take a little boat over there from, from St. Pierre and see the old, uh, uh, the old town, what's left of it. Anyway, these uh, things going out to uh, various places, particularly in France where most of them went, uh, were met with confusion <laughs> by uh, some of the receiving post office who hadn't quite seen one of these before. So somebody artistically inclined and compelled to outdo the St. Pierre with the own box caches have added their own box cache onto this letter to Paris uh, uh, in here received. Ooh, a little bit more attention was paid here because the clerk at Dijon applied a, a T and triangle for do in here and it looks like he went and attached a postage due stamp. Well, anyway, he must have got corrected by the uh, local postmaster and thought the better of it. You can see where they've gone to remove the, the uh, uh, tax stamp from French tax tap and overprint it just to be sure. I'm sorry, cancel it just to be sure and scratched out the T in here and delivered it to Mr. Matthew, who a, a well-known collector of covers from St. Pierre uh, and probably didn't charge them the tax after all. Uh, there's a few more examples, like I say, where some of these went to uh, uh, colonial outposts and I'm not sure what they made of them, but uh, certainly the idea here was to use the hand stamp to convince them that the postage was indeed paid and the letter could go forward without uh, additional charge. So just a little bit of a review here. I put these in order of denomination for, I don't know, I, I'm too used to catalogs that uh, take every set and whatever sort of date within a few years it occurred, uh, puts it in the order of the denomination. So here was the undenominated one. This is used in May, uh, sort of in the middle period of the stamp shortage. These are the five centime Caches. I, I like to include the forgery just so that you, it can be recognized uh, as, as, as being one in here. So this would be the uh, 005 or the five centime in the range of the uh, denominations here uh, uh, with the change in, in the uh, bottom box. The PPs, which move up in the denomination to 30 centime. So we've got the 30 centime, we've got the one with the quotation marks in here, and St. Pierre versus, uh, if I read that correctly, is the St. Pierre uh, abbreviation in here. Again, this one is sort of near the end. This is almost when the ship arrived in here with the, uh, the new stamps uh, supply. So sort of looking at the whole thing uh, and putting the whole catalog together here for this, I've got the PP over here, again, full spelled out St. Pierre. We've got the fives in here. This is my forgery, uh, don't forget that one. We end up with the St. Pierre here, the one day wonder. They took the saint out of the Pierre and they put the ST in. And then we get uh, the 30s coming in in here, which were earlier, come in earlier than this, but in a denomination sense, they're down with the 30s. And then the uh, PP with the quotes, again, the St. Pierre here versus the full spelling St. Pierre here. And that is one, two, three, well, don't count this one. One, two, 
three, four, five different types. The best ones to get are the one that was here for two days, the one that was probably here for one day. What are they worth? I don't know. I, uh, I bought mine when they were unrecognized. Uh, these two are not shown in the uh, Murray catalog from uh, 2010 to 11. They do show the more common ones. Uh, I, I look for them, you know, on eBay and Del Campe, uh, but uh, they're very, I don't think I've seen too many of them over the years uh, in there. So the last day, I did have a last day cover. The last day of the use of the PP with the French quotation marks in there and the dots uh, was July the 11th, 1926. The higher denomination stamps, like the 75 uh, centime, which uh, was the rate for registration, uh, were still in good supply, evidenced by their use on mail. Uh, and Certainly, probably some of those, if you can come across them, were probably used to pay uh, letters or registration fees for the higher letter rates to foreign countries. I'd like to, I, I had the uh, uh, rates to Canada. Uh, Canada had usually had a uh, 50 centime special rate since it was close. Uh, I think rates to uh, say the United States and other places would maybe uh, take a 75 centine stamp. So you have to look very closely at the dates compared to uh, you know when the, the shortage was going on to make sure you've got a good item. Now the reasons for the stamp shortage, uh, I keep asking the question both in St. Pierre and, and to other people that collect this, it's, it's really not known. I think probably the best explanation is an administrative uh, foul up and uh, they didn't get uh, the, the stamps that were needed in St. Pierre on the boat. Uh, also, since the commerce with the uh, alcohol and everything was going pretty strong, uh, I, I imagine there was a lot of uh, business mail and stuff like that besides the philatelic mail that, that seemed to uh, uh, come out of St. Pierre all the time. Uh, severe weather, could that have kept the supply ship from France? Uh, there's no evidence of an ice blockade in 1926. Uh, and even the harbor at St. Pierre is noted for being ice free most of the year. Uh, again, a, possibly a, a bureaucratic foul up. Or, and these are all sort of possibilities. And maybe someday we'll discover, uh, you know, one of the reasons for this. But as time moves on, uh, I, I think a lot of uh, um, information uh, may be unobtainable. Again, there's lots of these around, maybe not so many of the, the two scarce varieties, but the philatelic minded local inhabitants were sending these all over the place uh, to uh, friends and dealers in France. Uh, and uh, again, you can see while some of the, the lower denomination stamps were available, they were uh, making sure that they uh, 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 fancied them up with, uh, with stamps and stuff like that, and not registered, etc. cetera. Uh, and with some of the things like uh, uh, some of the caches on envelopes with no uh, postmarks, uh, probably involved some collusion of the sender with postal clerks. Uh, Robert Stone uh, has written about these in 1981. He was uh, the famous French uh, colonies collector of the uh, 70s and 80s. And there's many hundreds of these around. So if you see one for $75 a US or something like this, it's probably a little bit steep uh, because th these uh, are, are not that uncommon. And Anyway, when you collect them, it uh, lets today's collector trace the interesting postal history of a stamp shortage and use actually mailing pieces. And I did, uh, I think several years ago, show 
uh, my collection of these as a one frame entry in the uh, uh, stamp show at St. Pierre. That was, a, that was maybe six or seven years ago. And I did get the award for uh, a one frame uh, uh, best uh, uh, exhibit uh, out of that. So uh, it's, it's been an interesting uh, journey trying to put all these things together. Anyway, this is the catalog that I put out in the 1990 where I listed all of these and the delay catalog, there's uh, some of these uh, 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 one and two day uh, issues uh, are, are not uh, shown, but they have shown the commoner varieties uh, in their listing. And there's lots of references, uh, certainly uh, Stone uh, was very aware of the story behind this one. I've had my own uh, uh, different, uh, I had, I think a, 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 a 1999 American philatelist had an article in it that I wrote. And Jean-Jacques, uh, he, we, we talk about these things all the time, which are the forgeries and which are the good ones. So that is sort of the end of the presentation. And I'm open to questions, some of which I may or not be able to answer, but uh, why don't we uh, stop the share screen at this point, Mr. Chairman? I can do that. And I will uh, let every, remind everybody that I have muted you. So if you want to ask Jim a question, please unmute yourself. Then we can hear you. No questions? <laughs> I'll give them a minute here. Give them a minute here. OK, they, they, you got to learn how to unmute. I think one way you can unmute is you can press the space bar. That unmutes you, doesn't it? Or, whoops, it took me out here. And I thank Don for uh, offering some translations through the chat function as we went along, too. Oh, my pleasure to do that. It's uh, easy to do. Happy to help. Or to understand how the words, the way they're actually spelled in French. So, pépé, uh, pour payer, right? Yes. Made postage, right? Yeah. For example, and other things. I'm always happy to help with French if you, if anybody needs uh, help with that. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, happy to help with that. It's uh, second to me, second nature to me. So. I would just want to say I think it was a very interesting presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you. I have seen these, but I didn't realize what it was about. So. Very interesting uh, and thorough presentation. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, that's what these uh, presentations are all about. Uh, showing something maybe you didn't you've seen but didn't realize uh, there was some interest in, and also um, certainly if some people uh, uh, have more information than I do, uh, I'd appreciate you know hearing about it. Or uh, I think we've got it you know figured out after. Uh, well, we're coming up to 100 years here since these were uh, used, uh, but it's it's amazing. Uh, information can start to turn up uh, uh, where you don't expect it. Uh, for example, I, I know on uh, some of the flight covers to uh, St. Pierre and Miquelon in 1933, uh, I did buy some additional covers that were hidden in a, a safe in, uh, uh, Sydney, Nova Scotia for, uh, you know, decades and decades and decades. And it, it only got opened up when some poor fellow that uh, was involved with it passed away. So you never know where information is going to show up. Uh, Jim, I, I take it uh, the, pe the people running liquor to the United States had a pretty good, a pretty high probability of success. Uh, the revenuers weren't catching them. Yeah, I understand there was like a, a three mile limit that the revenuers, the, the, the ghost card cutters couldn't address, arrest anybody that was out beyond that. So they take their supply of liquor in these small motorboats, uh, turn the lights off, you know, go out the three mile limit from wherever they'd be, New York City or, or Philadelphia or something like that and wait for a little smaller craft to show up and offload 
liquor by the crate. So uh, obviously, when uh, I guess it is in the 1930s or so, when uh, prohibition got abolished, uh, there was like a huge depression in St. Pierre. I guess the, the government's ability to tax us is, is somewhat control our behavior, fortunately. I might mention that uh, even after prohibition was uh, uh, abolished in the United States, they still ran liquor to Newfoundland and to Prince Edward Island uh, to quench the thirst of uh, maritime Canadians. Uh, uh, after that, and uh, eventually, of course, uh, the liquor laws got uh, revised uh, and, and updated uh, as time went on. I've had the privilege of visiting St. Pierre and uh, the liquor warehouses are still there along the docks. Mm -hmm. They sure are. I always take pictures of them uh, uh, to remind myself and, uh, you know, a building in St. Pierre unless there's a fire, it's going to be there for another hundred years, you, you, the way they were built. Uh, and you saw the old pictures. Uh, every year you go to St. Pierre and uh, things are missing. You know, the, the old boats at the uh, long dories that they went fishing in disappear. Uh, they're all motor boats now. Uh, you know, you, you hope that... Uh, uh, you know, eventually these warehouses will be taken down and they'll put up a, a skating rink like uh, they have a, at some of them or a, 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 a swimming pool for the local residents or a, a sports facility. Have any of the warehouses been repurposed for other purposes or they're just sitting empty? Well, well you just mentioned the, they, biggest, they, the biggest warehouse Yes. is what's called the Frigger Freak. It's a giant yeah, uh, uh, refrigerator. It's, it's a giant refrigeration plant. Yeah. And it was built in 1918. The idea was to feed codfish to the French troops in the front in the First World War. However, the war was over before they could get the scheme underway. So what they did was they uh, during the time of uh, the liquor smuggling, it was a huge warehouse full of liquor. And if you go there today, it's still standing. Some of the windows are smashed, but it's also the dock where the local uh, oil tankers uh, discharge their loads into uh, uh, oil tanks uh, uh, at the, the old wharf uh, that was uh, uh, beside this uh, big old uh, deserted building. Well, if there are no more comments, I will briefly make a commercial announcement for February 23rd, the last Tuesday next month, Larry Rosenblum will talk to us about balloons and pigeons, communication during the siege of Paris, 1870 and 71. Mm -hmm. wow. Another fun part of French philately. Yes. And not colonial. So I encourage all of you to come back. I will, I promise to be more prompt next time. Please have patience if I'm not here right away. And uh, thanks to everybody for coming along. If you are not a member of the France and Colonies Society, we welcome you. You can find an application for membership at franceandcolonies.org on the internet. Thanks again. And good night to all. Good night. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Nice presentation. Really appreciate it. Yes. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. <laughs>